Right, everything is on, it's working here, okay. So welcome everyone um, to the second lecture today. Um, before we start, uh, Mark asked me to, uh, uh, to do a few household procedures. The first one is to remind you to send in a JPEG picture of yourself uh, so that we can make a group photo of the entire school, a virtual group photo, of course. Um, and uh, if you like, please give us a feedback on the school uh, to the, to the uh, email address that you have been given when you registered here. Okay, um, this afternoon's speaker is uh, Pablo Rayo Herrero. Um, I will give him give a short introduction of him or to him. Um, he's a native of Spain, did his first degree in, uh, at the University of Valencia before he took a master's degree at UC uh, San Diego. Uh, then came back to Europe to do his PhD with Leo Kovenhofen on uh, carbon nanotubes, I understand. And uh, then uh, this was followed by two further postdocs, one at Delft and one at Columbia, before he finally became assistant professor at um, MIT in, in 2008 where he has been uh, ever since, uh, being a full professor now. And uh, he is, uh, most of you will know that, uh, one of the inventors uh, together with Ellen MacDonald um, of uh, twisted uh, physics, if you will. And uh, that's what we are going to learn about today. Uh, so um, please give us an introduction to the wonderful world of uh, twisted uh, 2D materials, Pablo. Thank you very much. And I want to thank all the organizers for the invitation to, uh, to speak at uh, this school. I wish, you know, uh, we could see, uh, you know, each other in person in the, in the French Alps. You know, this is unfortunately mm -hmm. not possible. Um, I'm giving two lectures. So for today's lecture, I'll have a background that it's my home city of Spain. Valencia, this is the main cathedral. I hope one day you can visit. And for tomorrow's lecture, I'll uh, try to find a nice background of the shoes, actually, uh, so that I share, you know, the, the two places I would have liked to be most this summer. So, <laughs> so let me tell you, um, and, and thank you again, all of you who are, you know, they're listening to me. It would be great to see you in person, but hopefully, you know, next year or, or some other time. So I want to tell you about our studies of magic angle graphene super lattices and how it has become a new platform for strongly correlated um, physics and even beyond. Yeah? I think many of you are probably uh, somewhat familiar with the topic. Today is going to be a more introductory um, uh, talk. And then tomorrow I will go into a bit more detail into some of the more recent developments happening in my group. And I'll comment also on what's uh, happening, uh, you know, overall in the field with you know, other groups around the world, especially today at the end of the lecture. So, but I wanna start from a more, you know, general point of view, you know, and this is the fact that strongly correlated states of matter are pretty much ubiquitous in on all of physics, okay? This is not only condensed matter physics, but all of physics, you know, and among the, among the most fascinating states of matter that we have in the universe are such strongly correlated states of matters. This occurs, for example, with the quark gluon plasma. Okay, this is a state of matter that happens a few you know, hundreds of nanoseconds, microseconds after the Big Bang, and that we can recreate nowadays in heavy ion collisions in you know, accelerators, just this one at New Haven National Laboratory. The different phases of matter in nuclear, in neutron stars are also strongly correlated phases of matter. You know, you go to Wikipedia, you can see this. These phases, they're called nuclear pasta. So it's very funny, you have the, the lasagna phase, the bucatini phase, the spaghetti phase, you know. As usual, the, the astrophysicists are very creative at naming things, including neutron stars. And then perhaps a bit closer to, to our hearts in condensed matter physics, the fractional quantum hole states of matter, where, you know, you put a, you know, a, you, know you put the subject electrons in a two-dimensional electron gas to a strong magnetic field, and you realize a highly non-trivial, you know, topological state of matter where, you know, very interesting things like electrons, uh, you know, like, you know, objects acquire, you know, the charge objects acquire a fractional charge and they're all interesting topological phases, you know, that one, you know, abelian, non-abelian, et cetera, that one can recreate in these systems. 
So all of this, as you can see, strongly correlated states of matter you know, are pervasive. They are everywhere in physics. Now, if we go into condensed matter physics and in particular quantum materials, we can see that there are, again, a number of different you know, strongly correlated quantum materials. Some of these have, you know, are the heavy fermions, for example, which exhibit very unusual behavior. And for example, the electrons there are characterized by having a effective masses, which can be hundreds of times or even thousands of times those of the bare electron mass. Another system is our quantum spin liquids, where your spins, you know, even at zero temperature, they do not, you know, localize that they're constantly fluctuating, you know, the quantum fluctuations, and they result in a highly entangled topological state of matter. And perhaps one of the most studied, studied um, quantum materials are the high temperature superconductors. This is a phase diagram of the couplet superconductors, where in a phase diagram of you know, temperature versus doping, we have a variety of phases, few of which we have a complete understanding of, uh, even to this day after you know, more than three decades of investigation. So let me, you know, because it's a school and, you know, the first day, I want to start by something, you know, very simple. Let me start from, you know, what are the behaviors, you know, from the electronic transport point of view, what are the behaviors that, you know, we can have in materials? Yeah? Let's start with single particle band theory. Yeah? So this is your density of states, it's a function of energy, and it, these are two bands, okay, for your material, for your solid, and if this band is completely occupied with electrons, and this one is completely empty of electrons. This is an insulator, okay? This is the band gap of the insulator. And this is an insulator because, you know, your electrons cannot be thermally excited or excited by a voltage to conduct electricity because there is this large gap here between these two bands. So there are no available states at low energy so that the electrons can change state and conduct electricity through your solid. Now, if on the other hand, your Fermi energy is in the middle of a band, so you have, you know, this band is completely occupied, and now this band is partially occupied, okay? Could be anywhere here, let's say in the middle, for example. Now your electrons have, at infinitesimally low energy, available states where they can get excited, either, either via thermal excitations or by the application of a bias voltage. So electricity can flow through your system, okay? And this is... Uh, the characteristic of a metal. The system will conduct electricity, yeah? even at zero temperature. Now, from a single particle band theory, and again, in the, in the simplest approximations, these are the two behaviors that you have. Materials are either metals or insulators, and it depends whether they, you know, have a partially occupied band, you know, or a, you know, completely empty band and completely full bands, okay? So, however, if you include now many body physics, you can have something known as a correlative insulator. So for example, if you have a material where your Fermi energy is in the middle of this band, okay, but now due to strong interactions between your electrons, okay, a gap appears, okay, this band gets split into two bands, okay, and there is a gap here, and again, your Fermi energy now will be in the middle, so you go to a situation which looks very similar to this, Okay, where well, you have one completely occupied band and another completely empty, except that this thing is not a single particle band gap, but it's a correlated gap. Okay, and this, uh, you know, these materials, there's there are, you know, different types of such materials. One of the most famous ones is uh, the mod insulator. Okay, so now again, from a very you know, simple cartoon, let me tell you, let's imagine you have a lattice of atoms. Okay. So you see the square lattice of atoms. And now each of these atoms, you have one orbital. So you can put up to two spins, up to, up to two electrons per atom, okay? Spin up, spin down. Now let's imagine I put just one spin in each of these atoms, okay? Now you can imagine that because I have put half as many electrons in this lattice as I could put, okay? One per atom. Now these electrons can move, okay? So they could you know, go from atom to atom, you know, like this and conduct electricity, okay? However, in a number of materials, okay, this double occupancy, this double occupancy of an atom is energetically very costly, okay? It costs an energy U. So this means that no double occupancy is allowed, okay? And as a result, you get into an insulated state. 
Now, this is exactly sort of the, the realization of the cartoon that I mentioned, you know, the schematic band structure that I mentioned before. Now, why are mod insulators so famous and so, you know, have been studied so extensively? That's partly because they're believed to be the parent compound of the high TC cuprate superconductors. Right? So in the cuprate superconductors, you have these copper oxygen planes. You can put you know, for, for an undoped cuprate superconductor, what you have is a single electron per copper atom, okay? And there is a strong proportion between uh, electrons if you try to put two electrons on a single copper atom, right? Now, if you dope this system with holes, if you remove a few electrons, now an interesting game takes place, okay? And this, where electrons can hop from side to side, because now some sites are empty, and then the next electrons can go back and forth, etc. So the interesting game that plays under these conditions is, is known or is believed to be described by the so-called Haber model due to John Haber. Okay? This is the simplest model that is believed to capture the essential physics of high temperature cuprate superconductors. And again, there is an interplay between the penalty of double occupancy of your sites and the tunneling you know, between sites, okay? so when you have you know, with holes. And it is believed that this correlated motion of the electrons as some, you know, sites are empty and some other electrons keep hopping, you know, in a sort of a chain like this, gives rise to this phase diagram, you know, which is the high temperature cuprate uh, phase diagram. Now I say that it is believed to give rise to this phase diagram because there's actually no, you know, we cannot solve this Hubbard model even in the simplest cases exactly analytically, okay? You have to do, uh, approximations and then of course depending on which approximation you do you can get one result or another so there is no universally agreed upon map between this and this phase diagram okay and this is despite more than 30 years of intensive theoretical research now the difficulty in trying to explain this phase diagram this experimental phase diagram from you know, theoretically has led to alternative approaches to try to understand you know, the physics of mod insulators. And one of the most uh, impressive and successful approaches is that of using uh, ultra cold atoms in optical lattices. Yeah? So with, you know, what people can do, what atomic physicists can do is they can, they can shine laser at each other in a grid pattern. So they create a periodic potential, okay? Like this, you know, egg, you know carton, okay? So and you can actually tune the interaction between your atoms, okay, such that it's, you know, energetically favor or, you know, very unfavorable to have double occupancy of your system. And in fact, you can realize a superfluid to mod insulator transition, okay, by tuning this interaction parameter, okay? This is done using a trick called a flashback resonance. So already, you know, in 2002, the group of Immanuel Bloch and, you know, Max, Max Reiner, they were able to realize this Bose Haber model, okay? This was an implementation with bosonic atoms, or atoms with integer spin, okay? Now, a few years later, they were able to realize the Fermi Haber model, okay? So this time with uh, fermionic atoms, with half integer spin. And then the state of the art in the system, or at least as of a you know, couple of years ago, was that people were able to realize under ferromagnetism in the Fermi Haber model using this ultra cold atoms, okay? So this means that essentially the cold atom people using, you know, uh, this uh, optical lattices are starting to explore this corner of the phase diagram, okay? They realize mode physics, they are looking at the anti-ferromagnetic. Some, some studies have been up here, okay? However, they, you know, they would like to explore the entire phase diagram, you know, the pseudo gap phase, and in particular, which D wave superfluidity okay, uh, due to repulsive interactions. But in order to do that, there are serious obstacles because they need to go down quite a bit lower in temperature, okay? The experiments that the cold atoms people are doing are already at nano Kelvin, and they think they have to go into the tens or you know, hundreds of pico Kelvin in order to reach this limit. And although there are no fundamental limitations to doing so, there are actually very serious technical limitations. It's, it's, it's extremely hard. It's very challenging. So this means that they haven't been able to, to do that yet. Okay? 
So we have these, you know, two platforms, sort of, if you want to investigate strongly correlated physics, you have the actual quantum materials, okay, with a typical lattice scale of a few angstroms, you know, an angstrom or a few angstroms between atoms, you know. You have the ultra cold atoms in optical lattices where the typical length scale is about a micron between them, okay. And, uh, you know, this, this materials, they tend to be, well, uh, as experimentalists, we have relatively little tunability in these materials. Here in the ultra cold atoms, we have perfect tunability with these lasers. We can control everything absolutely in the systems, okay. What I want to tell you about today is that there's now a new set of, you know, a new platform, you know, where, you know, based on magic angle graphene, but actually it's much more general. Basically, it's many types of more uh, super lattices where you can investigate, you know, strongly correlated physics, okay? And the typical length scale is of order 10 nanometers. Yeah? Now, this is nicely, 10 nanometers is exactly, you know, two orders of magnitude from either of these other platforms in length scale. Yeah? Now, associated with the length scales, there are, there, are, there are energy scales, you know? So the typical energy scale here in quantum materials is, you know, between 100 Kelvin and 1000 Kelvin. You know, again, this depends on the material, but, in ultra cold atoms, I already told you this is more like a border and nano Kelvin. You know, as I will show you in magic angle graphene, typical scale is between, you know, you know one, 10 Kelvin. Okay? It's the typical energy temperature scale. Okay, so with this introduction, let me tell you, this is the outline of my talk today. So I will tell you first about a bit about 2D materials, Legoland, Twistronics, you know, you know, a number of words that you may have heard, you know, before. Then I'll tell you about graphene and in particular magic angle graphene super lattices. Then I'll tell you about our observation of correlative insulated behavior, half filling in the systems, then about superconductivity, and then a little bit about you know, the outlet and the latest result, uh, latest research, you know, but tomorrow will be when I focus more on the latest developments. So let me start with this. So for you know for now well over a decade, okay, uh, you know, 15 years or so. Physicists and you know, material scientists, chemists, engineers, we have been having enormous fun with 2D materials. The first one isolated was graphene, and then plenty others came through. Now, initially, we were just looking at, let's say, graphene, for example. Right? Now, after a few years, people realized that one thing that these 2D materials offer, which is an advantage with respect to other systems, is that you can stack them arbitrarily at will on top of each other. Okay? So this led to these you know, reviews by my friends and colleagues where they say that, you know, you, know, you, you can basically build, you know, you know, 2D materials, Lego stacks, you know, Lego pieces, you know, by arbitrarily putting materials on top of each other. Now, to some extent, you know, so for those of you that have, you know, played with Lego and, 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 and you know, I play with Lego, you know, quite often, you say I have small kids, you know, you see that, you know, sometimes my son comes or my daughter comes and, and they tell me like, oh, daddy, I cannot stack this piece on top of another. You know? And then I have to tell them, you know, oh, you know, this is because you have to perfectly align these two Lego pieces and then only you can stack them and press them on top of each other. Okay. So this, this uh, level and aspect of 2D materials, although it is um, a very important and very nice aspect, okay? I believe it's not perhaps the most unique aspect of 2D materials, you know? After all, you can also realize semiconductor, MB ground heterostructures or, you know, metallic MB heterostructures where some aspect of this Legoland is, is there, even though 2D materials give you more freedom because you don't need compa chemical compatibility or lattice mismatch compatibility. But in my opinion, the most unique aspect of 2D materials happens to be this. You know? The fact that you can rotate, you know, two, two, you know, stack two two-dimensional materials on top of each other with an arbitrary angle of rotation between the two crystalline lattices. Yeah? This is something that is completely unprecedented in the history of material science. It is something that you could not do before 2D materials came to the market. Okay? So you can put two 2D materials on top of each other at any angle of rotation that you want. This can be 30 degrees, 15 degrees, 10 degrees, 1.1 degrees, why not? As I'll show you later, okay? So this is something that is quite unprecedented. Now, let me stop this thing before you get a little bit busy. So 
let me show you what you can do with this. And before I do that, let me just introduce our, you know, our protagonist today, which is Graphene. So Graphene, as all of you probably know, is a, is a honeycomb of carbon atoms. Okay? All of these atoms are carbon and they're chemically equivalent, but they are crystallographically inequivalent. Okay? You have, in the honeycomb lattice, you have two sublattices. Often they're called the A and B sublattice. Okay? So I'll just, you know, color them with different colors here, red and green, okay? You need uh, two atom bases in order to tile a honeycomb lattice. Now, if you calculate what are the electronic properties of graphene in a simple type binding model, okay? Using simple quantum mechanics, you have that the energy versus momentum is given here. And this is something, a very unusual electronic structure. If you focus, you know, near the K points, okay, near the high symmetry point, the K points and K prime points, you see that you have this, you know, double cone structure. These are often called the Dirac cones, okay? So graphene, you know, a charge neutrality, okay, neutral graphene, the Fermi level lies here at this point, which is called often the Dirac point or the charge neutrality point. So graphene is a zero gap semi-metal or zero gap semiconductor. And you have this linear energy momentum dispersion, which is reminiscent of ultra relativistic particles, massless ultra relativistic fermions. In fact, the <coughs> Hamiltonian that governs the behavior of electrons in graphene is, is this, okay? And this is nothing else than the Dirac equation in two dimensions for massless particles, okay? You can see here energy is linear in momentum, and there is this pseudo spinner, which, you know, usually in the Dirac equation, this is a spinner which tells you whether the electron is, spin is up or down. Here, this pseudo spinner is just telling you whether the electron wave function is on the A sub lattice or on the B sub lattice. Now, the other, the only other thing that you need to know for the rest of my talk is that there are two of these valleys, two of these double data cones, they're called the K and K prime points. So you just remember this thing four. Electrons in graphene have four degrees of freedom, spin up, spin down, valley K, valley K prime. Just remember this number four, and that's it, okay? Now, so what happens if you put graphene on top of graphene? Well, as I showed a moment ago, okay, you put graphene on graphene, you get a moiré pattern, okay? Moiré pattern is a pattern, you know, that forms, you know, you can see here, okay, that a pattern, a super periodic, you know, you put two periodic structures on top of each other, you rotate them and you form this, you know, quasi-periodic structure, you know, and the more wavelength, the distance between the soccer balls that you see here in the screen, okay, is a function of the twist angle. Because these are two identical lattices, graphene on graphene, as you decrease the twist angle towards zero, the more wavelength goes all the way to infinity, it diverges, okay? This is not the case if the two lattice constants are different. Then there is a maximum size of your more pattern. Now, let me stop this and Let's see, you know, the, you know, this thing that I showed you here is what happens in real space when you look at a more at, at, at twisted bilayer graphene. Let's see what happens in momentum space and therefore also to the electronic structure. So if you look, uh, you know, if you have, you know, this is again graphene, this is the Dirac cones of graphene, the Dirac cone of graphene, this is the reciprocal space, okay? If you cut, if you have your Fermi surface at some finite value here, finite energy, you have Fermi disks here, okay? Now, if we put another graphene sheet on top of it, okay, and they are perfectly aligned, this means that the reciprocal spaces are also perfectly aligned, and this means that the Dirac cones of both layers are on top of each other, literally, okay? Now, what happens if now from this perfectly aligned case, I rotate towards large angle, okay? If I rotate towards large angle, then the reciprocal spaces also get rotated and by the same angle, okay? So I rotate in real space and the reciprocal spaces also get rotated in momentum space, okay? This leads to a separation in momentum space between the Dirac cones and the separation in momentum space between the charge neutrality points of the Dirac, cone of, uh, of the Dirac cones of layer one and layer two is given by this expression 2k sine theta halves, where theta is the angle of rotation. Okay? So, twisting leads to layer data cones separating in momentum space. Now, if the angle of rotation is small, sine of the angle is equal to the angle, okay? So, 
this separation in momentum space will be proportional to the angle, okay? So let me start from an angle which is small and then let's go towards smaller and smaller and smaller angle and let's see what happens. So this is the electronic structure in, you know, for, you know, the direct cones coming from one layer from the other, okay, the separation between the charge neutrality points is proportional to the angle. And this is what would happen if electrons in one layer in one graphene sheet did not know that the other graphene sheet exists, okay? These direct cones would just interpenetrate each other. Now, however, electrons in, you know, these two graphene sheets are just spaced by three angstroms. Okay, so electrons in one sheet are very much aware that they are, you know, the other sheet is present because they can tunnel between the two layers. So this leads to a hybridization at these crossing points, okay? So this interlayer interaction or hybridization, W, opens a gap here, okay? And this is the situation that is realized when this gap to W is much smaller than B Fermi K theta, which is that crossing point energy, okay? So a small gap opens here compared to the energy at which that point is. However, as you now rotate your two lattices towards smaller and smaller angle, okay? This crossing point goes towards lower and lower energy, okay? And this band which is pushed towards lower energy becomes pushed towards lower, lower, and eventually becomes a flat band. Okay, so as we decrease the twist angle, we get that a flat band, one of these bands gets pushed down all the way to zero energy. Okay, this occurs when 2w is equal to v at k theta. So this flat band condition is reached at the magic angle. And this magic angle has been, you know, was calculated for graphene to be 1.1 degrees. Okay? So the term magic angle and this calculation of 1.1 degrees was, you know, done by Bistritzer. McDonald, but there were earlier experiments, scanning tunneling microscopy experiments by the group of Ivan Dre, where they already, you know, this this region here has a peak in the STM spectroscopy due to a von Hoff singularity. And this peak in this experiment by Ivan Dre's group, they saw that this peak went all the way to zero when uh, the angle was close to 1.1 degree. Okay? And also there were, you know, calculations by the group of Suarez Morel in Chile where they saw that, you know, they, they calculated the different value for this angle, but they already saw that there would be flat bands at a particular angle. So there was quite a bit of interesting, you know, single particle work, you know, already, you know, a decade ago. Now, this thing that I showed you is sort of a schematic cartoon, okay? Let me show you an actual video now of an actual calculation video of the electronic structure for twisted ballet graphene and how it evolves as you go towards low angles, including the magic angle. So the thing that uh, you see here, I have the two reciprocal spaces of, you know, graphene layer one and graphene layer two, okay, the blue and the red. Now, if you join these corners, okay, you take the K points of each of the layers and you join them, and then you complete the hexagon, this corresponds to the super lattice brillouin zone or the moiré brillouin zone, okay. Now, in real space, as I make the angle smaller, the Moray wavelength increases. This means in momentum space, the Moray Brillouin zone decreases, okay? Remember, you know, big in real space means small in momentum space. So in this video that I have here, what you see is this is the electronic structure. So, so, so you know, energy versus momentum, the dispersion for twisted by radio graphene. Now, for this angle three degrees, within this energy window, this just looks identical to graphene, okay? These are the six direct cones, only two of them are independent. The others are copies, okay? But reciprocal space lattice vectors. Um, when I, oh, sorry, let me go, let me go back, uh, let's see. Yeah, so when I run this video, the first thing that you're going to see is that as the angle decreases, this, you know, this Brillouin zone is going to become smaller and smaller, okay? And then you're going to see a reconstruction, you know, a changes in the electronic structure that will be particularly pronounced when you hit the magic angle. So let me run this video. 
So you see at the beginning, nothing happens, but now, okay, within this energy window, already at two degrees at 1.5, there is this set of flatter bands with gaps, and this is becoming flatter and flatter and flatter. There you see it went through a flat band period, and then it continues evolving the electronic structure in a complicated manner, okay? Let me run this video again, okay? You can see there's going to be these bands are separated by band gaps from the next set of moiré bands or super lattice bands. And now at 1.1, there's going to become a flat band. Now, you see? And then the system continues evolving in a complex manner, okay? So, let me, sorry. You know, now if you include lattice relaxation, you know, it seems like this magic angle is a little bit closer to 105 degrees. But this, you know, this, this value continues evolving as people make you know, make better and better theoretical models. And in fact, there seems to be a range of angles for which magic happens, as I will mention you know, tomorrow. So now let's take a look at that flat band there, okay? So this is a cut of that electronic structure, focusing a bit more. This is the set of flat bands, okay? Now, as you can see, it's not absolutely flat, okay? But it's very flat. It's much flatter than the original graphene dispersion. Now, what does it mean to have electrons in a flat band, okay? So flat in reciprocal space, in momentum space, means highly localized in real space, okay? Remember, you, you can do this, uh, you can do a Fourier transform. You know, to go, to go from momentum space to real space, you need to do a Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform of a flat line, okay, is a delta function. So if you look at where are the electrons, you know, the electrons that sit in these flat bands, you know, where do they like to be, okay? They like to be in certain regions. They're highly localized in certain regions in your more structure, okay? In particular, they like to be in regions which are called of AA stacking. In regions where locally it appears that all of the carbon atoms in layer one are on top of all of the carbon atoms of layer two. They're right on top of each other locally. Okay? Now these regions where the electrons like to sit are tunnel coupled, okay, via regions which are called of AB and BA stacking, where the carbon atoms, half the carbon atoms are displaced with respect to the others. Okay. From you know a schematic point of view from the top, therefore this Moore pattern looks like this. We have regions where locally we have AA stacking. The electrons like to sit in those regions, and these regions are separated by regions of AB and BA stacking. Okay, this you know in a, in a slightly more realistic but still schematic point of view, you know this is what we have. The distance between these AA regions, which are here uh, shaded yellow, is 13.4 nanometers. And this is going to constitute our triangular fermi haber lattice, okay? Put triangular in, in quotes because in reality, these A, B, and B, A regions are non-equivalent. So this is actually a honeycomb more lattice. And <coughs> here is where our electrons are going to like to sit. And now we're gonna be able to play with this system, okay, with this platform. Now, let me tell you about our observations. But before I do so, let me actually tell you how do we fabricate these devices, okay? Because a lot of people are curious about how are we able to make these type of devices. So we start with a glass light, which has a polymer stack, transparent polymers, okay? Different set of transparent polymers, you know. Then we bring a substrate, which has hexagonal boron nitride on it. Hexagonal boron nitride is also a layered material. And in this case, it's something, you know, let's say of order 10 nanometers in thickness. And it's going to be a rigid substrate where graphene would like to sit, okay? Then with our sticky polymer, we go down and we pick up the hexagonal boron nitride from the substrate, okay? All of this is transparent, including the hexagonal boron nitride. So then we bring down a substrate, which has graphene on it, monolayer graphene on it. And then we position our hexagonal boron nitride on top of this graphene layer, sort of halfway, so that the edge of the hexagonal boron nitride is halfway on top of this, okay? And then we do this simple, this simple thing. We use a tear and 
you know, a tier and stack method. So what we do is we go down and we tier half of the graphene. Okay, by now, by now we have other more sophisticated ways of doing this, but this is how the experiments were done originally. We tear half of the graphene. So from the top, this looks like this. We have our substrate, which has half of the graphene, and then we have the glass slide with the polymer, the hexagonal boronitide, and the other half of the graphene, which is now at a different height. Okay, so then we you know, it is important to note that these two pieces of graphene, which are now at different heights, they are crystallographically aligned because they came from the original graphene crystal, okay? Uh, original monolayer graphene flake. So then we can now rotate the substrate or the glass line by any amount, by any angle that we want. For example, 1.1 degree, why not? Okay, and then we can shift them on top of each other, and then we can stack one graphene piece on top of the other, okay? And then we pick it up, and then we have at the bottom of this hexagonal laboratory flake, this moiré pattern formed by these two graphene flakes which are rotated with respect to each other by an angle which we have chosen at will. We can choose whichever angle we want, okay? Then we continue fabricating our device. The rest of this process is standard. You pick up another hexagonal boronitra flake. And in the end, you end up with a device that looks like this. We have our twisted bilayer graphene with any angle of rotation between the two graphene sheets that we want. It is enca encapsulated at the top and the bottom by hexagonal boronitride. Okay? And then we have made source and drain contacts so that we can apply a voltage and measure a current. And we also have a nearby gate electrode, a nearby metallic plate with which the graphene forms a parallel plate capacitor so that by applying a gate voltage, we can control the density of electrons in the twisted bilayer graphene, okay? And then let me tell you, remind you, you know, then we can go over experiments. Let me remind you how is conduction through regular graphene, yeah? If you measure the conductivity of graphene versus Fermi energy or gate voltage, charge density, you know, whatever you want to put here. If your Fermi energy is deep in the valence band, okay, you have plenty of holes in your system, the system conducts very well, so you have high conductivity. If your Fermi energy is deep into the conduction band, you have plenty of electrons in your system, so your system conducts again very well, you have high conductivity. If your Fermi energy is at the charge neutrality point, you have nominally zero charge carriers, and therefore you have very little conductivity. Okay, so the conductivity of monolayer graphene versus gate voltage over density is always has this sort of V-shaped behavior, okay? Now, let's look at what happens for twisted bilayer graphene. So let me start with a device which has a large angle of rotation between the graphene sheets. And by large, I mean, you know, more than two or three degrees, okay? So here's conductivity. And here I'm writing density, but density normalized by what we call super lattice density, okay? The super lattice density is how many electrons you can put in a more super lattice per unit cell, okay? And this density to, in, in, you know, in the flat bands, you can put four electrons or four holes per more unit cell, okay? So density is density of electrons divided by four electrons per more unit cell, okay? So one means four electrons per more unit cell, Minus one means four holes per more unit cell. Now, as you can see, for a large twist angle device, you have this V-shape behavior, okay? Because for large angles, twisted by layer graphene just looks like graphene. Now, let me show you what happens when you have a small angle, okay? Again, this just looks like graphene. Let me show you what happens when you have a small angle, but not yet magic, okay? Something like 1.8 degrees, yeah? So if you have a 1.8 degrees, already you know, within the accessible density range, you have these gaps, okay? You have these bands, you know, in these bands you can put four holes, you know, from charge neutrality you can put four holes or four electrons per more unit cell, okay? But now once you have filled this band, you have put four electrons per more unit cell, okay? Or you empty it completely, you have four holes per more unit cell, you reach a band gap. 
Therefore, your conductivity, you know, near charge neutrality is still V-shaped because here you have near charge neutrality still your Dirac cones. But then when you put four electrons or four holes per molar unit cell, you reach your band gap. So you go through an insulated state before your Fermi level can go into the remote bands and you start conducting again. Okay, so these states, <coughs> sorry, these states are single particle band gaps. This band insulator, you know, single particle band gaps, they are more or less understood within single particle physics. Correlations affect them a little bit, but to zeroth order and to first order, these are just single particle band gaps. Yeah? Now, let me show you what happens when you measure a device which has an angle equal to the magic, you know, very close to the magic angle. So this is a device which has a 1.08 degrees rotation angle, okay? Now you have a flat band with large gaps between the flat bands and the remote bands. Now you can see that near charge neutrality, you still have V-shape because if you zoom in down there near charge neutrality, you still have sort of your Dirac cones, okay? For four electrons per molar unit cell or four holes per molar unit cell, you have zero conductivity because of these large single particle gaps. But now look what happens, you know, near half filling, when you put half as many electrons as you can put in your conduction band, or half as many electrons as you can put in your balance band, you have also insulated states. The system should be a metal, but it turns into an insulator, okay? So this is something that happens only around the magic angle. Now, let me show you data with you know, real units on both axes. These are you know, conductance in millisiemens, density of electrons in units of 10 to the 12 electrons per square centimeter, okay? So these are the exact same data as before, but now with real units, okay? Without normalizing. You can see this is the insulated state when you have, you know, remember, this is the charge neutrality point for here. In this direction, we're electron doping. In this direction, we're hole doping, okay? This is the insulated state when you put four electrons per molar unit cell, so that's the NS. When you put minus NS, four holes per molar unit cell, you get another insulated state. And you have at NS over two, minus NS over two, two electrons per molar unit cell, two holes per molar unit cell, you have these insulated states, okay? Now, this behavior occurs only for angles very close to the magic angle, okay? Basically, plus minus you know, 0.1, maybe 0.15 degrees from 1.1 degrees, okay? So when we saw this insulating behavior, that was the first thing that we noticed, that it only happens right around this magic angle. Second thing that we noticed is that it was a very special type of insulator, okay? And this we noticed in the magnetic field evolution, okay? If you take, if you measure this, you know, insulated behavior, the conductivity here, okay? And here black means insulator, red and yellow means conductor. So if you apply a perpendicular magnetic field to the system, the system goes from an insulator to a metal. Okay? System goes from an insulator to a metal when you apply a few Tesla. Now, that's something very, very strange, okay? When you have a system of two-dimensional electrons, and you apply a magnetic field, electrons, because they're charged particles, they start going in circles. If you go in circles, you don't go anywhere. So typically, you expect the system, when you apply a magnetic field, you know, two-dimensional electron system, when you apply a magnetic field perpendicular to it, you expect the system to go from a metal to an insulator, or if it's already an insulator to start with, you expect it to become a stronger insulator. It is very strange that you go from an insulator to a metallic behavior when you apply a perpendicular magnetic field. Okay? So this was something that was already very strange. And then coupled to the fact that these states only appear for in a very narrow range, angular range around you know, 1.1 degrees, you know, long story short, you know, what it started to become clear to us is that you know, we came up with the following picture. These insulated states are correlated insulator states. In our original paper, we call them mod like in the sense that they appear at this half you know, integer filling of the complete conduction band or valence band. Okay? So in a single body picture, you have a band, and these are the flat bands okay, with the charge neutrality point. When you put your Fermi energy 
halfway into the conduction band, so a two electrons per mole in itself, in the many body picture, a correlated gap appears, okay, which is to an insulated behavior. Now, this correlated gap appears, and this, when you apply a magnetic field, and again, I, I showed the data with a perpendicular magnetic field, but this happens with the magnetic field in any direction, perpendicular or in plane, and in particular in plane, the system, okay, which is um, the spins due to Siemens splitting start to close this correlated insulator gap, and this is the terms into a metal. And that's why you have a finite magnetic field in insulator to metallic transition. Now, we have you know, additional measurements that you're welcome to look at in the, in the paper. And I should mention that this original behavior that we described as mod like the exact theoretical description of this correlated insulator behavior is still not uh, well understood, okay? There are many, many possibilities, okay? It, it is becoming slowly clearer and clearer what constraints, you know, due to the amount of experimental data we have. You have to pose, put on the theoretical models, okay? But there, I, I would say there's not yet, you know, universally agreed upon consensus theoretically on what is the correlated insulator origin, you know, macroscopic description. I should mention that there was related work on, you know, they, they were a bit braver. They call it straight mod insulator state in ABC trilogyrophene on hexagonal boron nitride by the group of Feng Wang at Berkeley, and they, they, they had results shortly after us. Now, let me tell you about our discovery of superconductivity in this system. So, you know, this is the same data that I showed you before. Now, I should mention that these data were data taken in a two terminal geometry. These were devices which has a source contact and a drain contact, just two terminal. Now, because you know, we were looking, um, you know, th th this geometry is very good if you're trying to look for insulated states, because if your system is insulating, okay, the conductance is going to go to zero, and it doesn't matter if you have some, a little bit of extra contact resistance due to your source and drain electrodes, okay? So when we were doing these experiments, we were looking a bit more closely at these insulated states and we noticed the following. Around the correlated insulated state for electrons, uh, two electrons per mole in itself, when we cool down, the more, you know, the temperature, you know, the, the, you know from 1.7 Kelvin to 0.3 Kelvin, the colder it became, the least it conducted. And that's okay. That's the way insulators are supposed to behave when you, go cold, they conduct less. So this was sort of okay. Now, near the correlated insulated state for holes, we saw the following. Right at two holes per mole unit cell, it was the exact same behavior, okay? The colder we went, the least the system conducted. However, very close to it in doping, you add a few extra holes, we noticed that here, the colder it went, the more it conducted. Okay, so hmm, when our students, you know, when, sorry, when my students showed me this, I was like, I remember they asking me, wouldn't it be funny if this really wanted to superconduct or something like that? And I said like, okay, it would be very funny. Let's measure it. Let's make sure we make four terminal devices and let's look for this to see if this is present, okay? So then we made four terminal, four probe, you know, devices in a four probe device geometry, the exact same fabrication procedure as before, but now we can measure the drop in resistance inside the device without, you know, eliminating the contact resistance because we have four terminal device geometry. Yeah? And we made, you know, a couple of devices and indeed, let me show you, this is, again, we characterize them first in the two terminal geometry, this is a new device. You know, different from the one I showed before. This one is a 1.16 degree angle. This is the two terminal uh, uh, conductance versus density. Remember, this is charge neutrality, V shape. Then we have at four electrons and at four holes per mole unit cell insulative behavior. We have this deep again at two holes or at two electrons and two holes per mole unit cell. This is with a small perpendicular magnetic field applied, 0.4 Tesla. If we now apply and remove the magnetic field, you can see that a little bit something happens, but not too dramatic around two electrons per mole unit cell, but around two holes per mole unit cell, things turn a little bit crazy. In fact, if you 
now switch to a four terminal geometry and you measure and you measure this and another device, you see that you know, magic angle graphene superconducts. Okay? The resistivity versus temperature shows this pronounced drop all the way to zero, you know, below a main noise measurement floor. Okay. So magic angle graphene is a superconductor. Okay. Now you can do, you know, you look and look at the VI curves, you see this characteristic flat, you know, zero voltage drop when you apply a finite current bias, okay, which then switches to a finite resistive state. Okay. And then as a function of temperature, you see how this evolves. You know, you can do you know, constantly thousands type of uh, transition studies. You can do anything that you want to the system to, you know, you can investigate it in any way you want to check if it is a superconductor. Magic and graphene is a superconductor, okay? And in particular, the nice thing that we can do is that we can, as I told you, you know, earlier, we can change, we can vary the electron density or the whole density in this case, the system. So if you go near the correlated insulated state and you measure the resistivity as a function of temperature and hold open, you see that there is this correlated insulated region and next to it, there are these two superconducting states, you know, which have sort of a dome, okay? So when my students showed me this, I was really very, very, very surprised. And immediately the first thing that came to my mind is the hundreds of times that I have seen phase diagrams such as this, okay? This is the phase diagram of <coughs> high temperature cuprate superconductors for, you know, at zero doping, okay? This system is a mode insulator. This is, you know, let me actually flip it, okay? Sorry. So they do hold doping to the right and electron doping to the right. Let me flip it so that it looks the same as in our case. Okay? Electron doping to the right, hold doping to the left, okay? This zero doping corresponds to one electron per more unit, per copper uh, atom. Okay, you have a mode insulator. When you dope with holes, you have a big superconducting dome. When you dope with electrons, you have a small superconducting dome. In our case, at two holes per more unit cell, you have a correlated insulator state. When you dope with holes, you have superconducting dome. When you dope with electrons, you have another superconducting dome. Okay. Now, a big difference. You know, there are many similarities, but also many differences between these two things. You know, uh, I, I won't dwell too much on on that at the moment. But let me just mention. Uh, Fundamental difference between these two plots is that this one is a theoretical plot, okay? In order to make this phase diagram out of experimental data points, you need to have, you need to grow a different crystal and different types of crystalline materials, you know, to, you know, different compositions, different materials to do hole doping, electron doping, and even within electron doping or hole doping, only certain materials can, be doped with a certain dope range. So this diagram is theoretical, whereas, you know, and it takes hundreds of crystals in order to build this phase diagram, whereas here, we're building this entire thing, we're measuring this thing in one device with a single disordered realization. And we go from here to here in 10 seconds by dialing an electrical knob, okay? So that's a fundamental difference between these, type, uh, these two types of platforms. Now, this is, you know, the most symmetric we've seen this, you know, electron and hole domes is this, you know, this is data for another device. Here, TC is actually substantially larger. So optimal, you know, at optimal doping TC is 1.7 Kelvin. And this, you know, dome for electrons is very, very small. In this case, also the correlated insulated state is actually quite weak. This, there is a large variability on this, as I will show you in a, in a bit more detail tomorrow, okay? Now, this is a superconductor, so if you apply a magnetic field, you kill it, and you can again apply a magnetic field, uh, measure the resistance at different magnetic fields versus temperature. You can extract, you know, what is the critical magnetic field for perpendicular and for parallel magnetic fields. You know, you can apply a much larger parallel magnetic field because this is a 2D, two-dimensional superconductor, so there is, there is very little orbital effect, okay? In fact, you can do all of this continuously as a function of density. Again, so this is the resistivity for these two devices versus hole density near the correlated insulated state and perpendicular versus perpendicular magnetic field. This is the correlated insulated state. This is the superconducting dome, but now not as a function of density, but as a function of B perpendicular here. Sorry, not, it's not, not as a function of temperature, but you know, 
as a function of perpendicular magnetic field. So now I remember when I showed this to my student, I asked them, sorry, when my students showed this to me, I asked them, so, you know, this looks nice, but it looks a little bit noisy. What is, what is, what is all that noise? What is all this crap, you know? And then we were, you know, looking at it and we realized, wait a moment, that's not noise. That thing actually looks periodic, okay? So it turns out when you put your Fermi level, you know, close to the correlated insulator state between the superconducting state and the correlated insulator state, then the system doesn't know what to do. Should I go superconducting or should I go insulator? So the system goes sort of both, you know, it, it segregates into superconducting and uh, insulated regions. So these come from a set of justice and junctions that can give rise to Fraunhofer type interference under an applied perpendicular magnetic field, okay? So you can actually sit at a particular density and now measure what is your differential resistance as a function of current bias and perpendicular magnetic field. And you see these Fraunhofer-like oscillations, okay? The pattern can vary substantially because depending on what just your specific density, you will have a different arrangement of superconducting and insulating regions, but they typically get dominated ultimately by two junctions forming a squid, okay? And these two junctions can be a symmetric or an asymmetric squid. So we can model, you know, most of the patterns that we see by looking at, you know, a squid with two junctions with, you know, symmetric or asymmetric critical currents in a given area, okay? But this actually is very nice because this has, you know, this is the ultimate proof that you actually have superconductivity because you're looking at, you're seeing the Josephson effect, okay? You're seeing phase coherence in your superconducting system, in your system, which means there is actually super, true superconductivity. So in some other studies that people have uh, shown resistance drops close to zero, uh, where they thought they had a superconductor, they weren't, you know, ultimately, it's not clear that those systems were superconducting because they couldn't show, you know, for example, just as an effect that you can see in magic and So now, let me also tell you, you know, we have, you know, our system is, you know, these flat bands, this, you know, they, they, they are in, in this graphene system, which is a high quality, high mobility two dimensional electron gas, okay? So you can measure your, resistivity as a function of density and perpendicular magnetic field continuously up to high magnetic fields. And you can see a lot of stuff, okay? Here I'm showing from charge neutrality bond towards holes, just to, to zoom in in certain features here. This big yellow region is the band insulator, okay? So this occurs at four electrons per mori, four holes per mori unit cell. This here is the correlated insulator state. And the first thing, the thing that I want you to pay attention is that you have landau fan diagrams. I have optimized this contrast so that you can look at this one that stems out of this correlated insulator state, okay? But you have also fan diagrams coming out of this band insulator, coming out of the charge neutrality point. In fact, this one is very beautiful, but it's down here within this color contrast. You cannot see it very well, but this one is typically the highest quality one. So, you can see here the superconducting dome down at, at very close to zero magnetic field. That's a superconducting dome, okay? So what you can see here is that these lambda fan diagrams, you know, this tunic, the maximum of the tunic of the house oscillations, you know, it give you these lines and lambda fan diagrams tell you what is the degeneracy of your lambda levels, okay? And Initially, it was a big surprise, you know, that we saw that for the fan diagram that comes out of the charge neutrality point, also the one that goes uh, away from the band insulator, you see that these lambda levels have the degeneracy of four, okay? However, the one that comes out of the correlated insulated state has the degeneracy of two, okay? The filling factor for these ones is, you know, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, okay? So it seems that there is a broken symmetry state here where you don't have the full degeneracy, you know, spin and valley of electrons in graphene, okay? I will mention more about this tomorrow in my second lecture, okay? We think, you know, we understand now what's going on, okay? But initially this was a surprise. 
it was also surprised the fact that this fan diagram went in this direction, but not towards the right. You know, you would expect it to be also going towards the right, but it only went towards the left here. Okay. Again, tomorrow I will show you what is our current understanding of what the situation is here. Now, this um, you can look at this tunic of the has oscillations, and you can look at the temperature dependence and measure the effective mass. And you can see that it seems like starting from charge neutrality as you go towards holes, you know, your effective mass increases. And then there is kind of a reset near the correct insulated state. And then you start all over again. You see both in the frequency of the tunic of the has oscillations and in effective mass. Okay. And you see that the slope here is the genesis four, this is the genesis two. Again, this is the four for the remote band. Okay? All of these things, which we saw in our original paper two years ago, and they were relatively mysterious, now we think we have a better understanding given recent experiments, and I will show you tomorrow. But you know, just in case some of you are not able to make it tomorrow, let me just tell you that there is a Fermi surface reconstruction when we go from here to here. The system spontaneous, you know, the system breaks symmetry between your four flavors, you know, spin up, spin down, valley k, valley k prime. The system decides to choose two of them, and that's why you get this. Okay, I will talk more about that tomorrow. Now, how strong a superconductor is magic handle twisted by layer graphene? Okay, so you know, on one hand, TC is a few Kelvin, as I have shown you. So what's the big deal? You know, super superconductors, you know, TC is up to 100 and something Kelvin, right? But the way we compare superconductors is not typically for, you know, by determining, you know, by comparing how high their TC are. That's very important, for example, for applications, but from the physics point of view, it's not the fun more fundamental uh, characterization. What way people compare superconductors is by, uh, you know, uh, pointing out what is the TC given how many electrons are there contributing to the superconductivity, okay? And this is typically uh, expressed in this plot of, you know, TC versus Fermi temperature. This, this is something called a Uemura plot, okay? Uh, or one version of a Uemura plot, you know. So in this lock lock, plot, okay, you have here TC in log scale, you have here Fermi temperature or, you know, density of two electrons normalized by effective mass and degeneracy or, you know, here in this case, 1.52 into the 3D to the two thirds, you know, when you are looking at bulk superconductors so that every data point can be put in the same here, okay? So let me guide you a little bit. In this type of Uemura plot, conventional superconductors tend to be in this region, okay? For example, take aluminum. Aluminum has a TC of one Kelvin, okay? But it has a gigantic amount of electrons contributing to superconductivity, you know? In particular, the Fermi temperature is of order, you know, 100,000 Kelvin. So given how many electrons aluminum has, its TC is pretty modest. So the TC over TF ratio is very, very small, okay? And the more conventional a superconductor is, typically the more it figures in this corner of the phase diagram. As we move towards, you know, diagonally towards the upper left in this diagram, you go towards more unconventional and unconventional type of superconductors, okay? For example, in this purple band here, you have many, many of the unconventional superconductors. For example, you have here the cuprates, you have here the iron nictites, you have here some of the organics, you have the heavy fermions. I even put here some data points uh, for ultra cold atoms, okay? Now both axes multiply by 100 million so that they appear here, but in terms of strength, coupling strength of the superconductivity, ratio of TC, uh, sorry, coupling strength, okay, uh, for the system, they're among the strongest coupled systems that one can realize, okay? The T now, very close to the VEC, VCS crossover. Now, where is magic angle graphene in the system, in, in this plot, okay? Magic angle graphene happens to be here, okay? It's among the strongest coupled superconductors that one that we're aware of, okay? 
Perhaps the only one which is a little bit, tiny bit above is this monolayer iron selenide on STO, which as you know, has an extremely high TC with a relatively low density of charge carriers. Now, magic and graphene has a very small Fermi temperature, okay? Given how few electrons magic and graphene has, because again, it's a moray super lattice, and we're talking about you know, two holes per moray unit cell, and the moray unit cell is large by atomic standards. Given how, how few holes magic and graphene has in the superconducting state, its TC is very large, okay? In fact, by now, we have TCs of the order of three Kelvin, okay, in our best devices. So, magic and graphene is the lowest density two-dimensional superconductor by far, by over an order of magnitude over the next one, okay? Now, let me, so many, many questions remain, okay? And let me, the one that many people ask is what is the origin of the correlated insulated state and what is the symmetry of the superconducting of the parameter? And in case you haven't been paying attention to the archive, you know, this is just a small list of the initial papers that appeared. You know, I think I stopped updating this, you know, a few weeks after we published our paper, you know, all kinds of combinations have been proposed, you know, all letters of the alphabet, you know, S, P, D, F, S plus D, S plus P, S plus P plus D, you know, all possible combinations of symmetries of the other parameter, all types of explanations for the correlated insulated state. Let me not get too much into this, okay? I think there are some other theory papers, who, uh, other theory talks that may have spoken about this in a bit more. Let me just point out, um, so, okay, so the first paper after we published our paper was the, by Senke Shu and Leon Valens, the, then the floodgates sort of open. They proposed this D plus IT chiral topological superconductivity, you know, that, you know, we don't know yet if that's the case. Let me actually mention that there was this second paper posted by one by, by, by Gregory Volovic, um, you know, where he, you know, he's, he, he said the following, look, uh, and this is an email basically, which, which in summary says, you know, finally you've realized everything that I predicted, you know, which is you know, kind of interesting, you know, uh, but believe it or not, many theorists actually sent us those type of emails, you know. The funny thing about um, uh, this paper by Lovick is the following. It turns out that for many decades, you know, going back to the 50s or so, about a couple of times per decade, experiment appears that shows that graphite seems to be a very high temperature superconductor, including even room temperature. The original paper was room temperature superconductivity. Now, there was experiments that they were hard to reproduce, and therefore, you know, people weren't sure what to make of, uh, what to make of them. Okay? But in 2013 or 2014, uh, Volovic published a paper where, so well before our discovery, published a paper where he said, look, this is just too many people, too many years, you know, too many decades that people are looking at this. Um, there must be something there. And let me tell you what it is. All of these experiments, what they have in common is that they have been performed in turbostratic graphite. Graphite where there are small angular misalignments, misorientations between the graphene planes. If you have these small angular misalignments within the graphene planes, you are going to form flat bands. This is gonna give you strong coupling superconductivity and hence you're gonna get high temperature superconductivity. Okay? So then he published this in 2013, 2014. So after our discovery, he put this paper where he said, you see, you now finally made a well-controlled experiment, just two layers, small angle. You see, you have flat bands, you have strong coupling superconductivity. Now." Just stack a few more layers on top of each other and get room temperature, you know, get, come on, get to work, okay? So this was very interesting and you know, who knows? Maybe, maybe if we stack enough layers, you know, with small angles, we may get to, you know. You know I used to think that these experiments in graphite were, you know, I didn't know what to think about them, but now I'm a little bit like, hmm, maybe, okay? We'll see, we provide inspiration. So now let me tell you in the last um, five, 10 minutes, uh, 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 something that has happened, you know, what, what has happened since our discovery. So now the slide is experimental development since March. This is since March, 2018, when we announced our discovery. Okay, so I forgot to put there. So 
The first thing that happened is that we have reproduced our own results. Now that doesn't always happen, so it's good when you're able to reproduce yourself. Okay, so we have a lot more devices. You know, by now we're in fact mapping, you know, TC versus twist angle, and we find sort of this superconducting dome as a function of twist angle, not as a function of density, but as a function of twist angle. Other groups have also are starting to do this. More important that you reproduce in your own results is when others completely independently of you reproduce your results, okay? So this has happened by now by many groups and they have extended our results in very interesting uh, directions. The first one to reproduce our results, the first group to reproduce our results was a collaboration between a group of uh, Andrea Young and Corey Dean, okay? And they did a very nice experiment. Uh, the first you know, made a magic angle rotating device and they saw the same thing as we saw, okay? Correlating solid states and superconductivity. And the next thing they did is they did a device which had an angle of rotation larger than the magic angle, 1.27 degrees. They saw no correlation insulators and no superconductivity. But now remember, this magic angle condition, as I explained, depends on what is the interlayer hybridization, hybridization between your two graphene sheets, okay? So if, if you vary this interlayer hybridization, the electron tunneling between the two layers, and you can do this, for example, by varying the pressure, okay? Then a angle which was not magic, you can turn it into a magic angle, okay? And in fact, a few months you know, earlier, we had, you know, my, you know, myself with my collaborators, we had calculated, you know, what is the condition to have a flat band, so, for an angle to be the magic angle as a function of the pressure between the two layers. Okay. So and so this this group they were they were able to go exactly to the pressure theoretically predicted such that the magic angle condition would be reached. And indeed when they put this 1.27 degree device at a pressure of 1.33 gigapascals, they saw superconductivity and correlated insulated behavior where the, the it was absent at zero pressure. So this experiment, which was you know, really nice, demonstrated that indeed these flat bands, you know, confirmed, you know, that the flat bands are indeed which are responsible for superconductivity and correlated insulated states. Now, other things that can happen is, you know, this system you can tune, you know, you can do a lot of studies of superconductor insulated transition and metal insulated transition, and you can do also high temperature studies and look at, you know, it turns out the resistivity is linear, which, you know, is very reminiscent of the strange metal and plaque dissipation behavior that occurs in other correlated materials. I will speak a little bit more about this uh, hopefully tomorrow. Let me just show you, you know, in this cuprate phase diagram, there's this big wedge above the superconducting dome, which has this strange metal behavior. Let me show you, this is the resistivity versus temperature for one of our graphene samples. You can see it's, you know, very straight, very linear, up to pretty high temperature. You know, this is temperature higher than the Fermi temperature in the system. And only when you get down to superconducting state here, this is one of our low lowest TC samples so we could get the linear behavior down to the lowest temperature deviates, okay? This is very linear behavior. I'll tell you more about this tomorrow. Then we have also measured anisotropies in the parallel critical field and uh, critical current versus parallel field, which indicate that the superconducting state is pneumatic in the system. Again, this is something that I will spend quite a bit of time tomorrow. So let me just show you, you know, for one of our high TC samples, three Kelvin, okay? We measure the resistivity versus direction of magnetic field angle. And you have these two maxima. Two maxima indicates an ellipse, which means your, you know, three-fold rotational symmetry of your lattice has spontaneously been broken to a two-fold symmetry, an ellipse. Again, I will talk about this tomorrow. So come back tomorrow for the second lecture. Now, something very interesting that happened is that magnetism, ferromagnetism, anomalous hole and quantum anomalous hole physics, in other words, topology has been realized in the system. So in fact, this field is quickly, has quickly become a, a sort of a new, you know, a paradigmatic, you know, uh, way of doing condensed matter physics that has brought together three different communities, you know, that did not interact as closely before, you know. We have, of course, the 2D materials, you know, 2D van der Waals materials and heterostructure community, you know, people that do investigate graphene, etc. 
and, and transition metadata company nights, etc. Then we have the strongly correlated materials. We will investigate cuprates, nictads, and other materials. And then also the community of the topological quantum metaphysics community, you know, that you know that's quantum pop physics, etc. So all of these three communities and fields come together in correlated more heterostructures. Okay. And for me, it's, it's one of the most satisfying things. You know, I'm learning so much from, from these different communities and seeing all these people, you know, discussing and working together is, is really one of the most satisfying things about, about these fields and, and that interests me the most. So in, you know, together with my theory collaborators, you know, we published a paper in 2019 where we said that, you know, these, you know, different types of more heterostructures, you know, you could realize, you know, bands with a finite chain number, you know, and you know, this would lead to, you know, quantum anomalous whole effect and, you know, depending on, you know, which number you have, you know, different values of quantization, etc. There was a lot of related theory work and a lot that has been worked since. And then in, in you know, early 2019, the group of David Goldhub and Gordon measured this large, very large anomalous whole effect indicating ferromagnetism, orbital ferromagnetism in magic angle graphene, where one of the graphene sheets was aligned to the hexagonal boron nitride lattice. This breaks a so-called C2T symmetry, it breaks a symmetry in the system that enables this realization. And then, a few, uh, you know, maybe about six months later or something like that, the group of Andrea Young very nicely showed that if, if you make higher quality devices, you can actually get quantized, you know, anomalous Hall effect, okay, in this system, you know, so quantization at zero magnetic field. Okay. There was also similar experiments done in ABC triagraphene aligned to HBN by the Penguin group showing similar physics. So this has been by now in several systems. Now, um, this field of more heterostructures goes beyond just magic angle graphene. You have, for example, now magic angle twisted by layer by layer graphene. So, you know, four groups have by now published results on the system. Okay, so if you have, if you take Bernal stack bilayer graphene, so with AB stacking everywhere, uniform, you know, with zero degrees twist angle, Bernal stacking bilayer graphene, and then you take another Bernal stack bilayer graphene, okay, so you have four layers total, but you twist them pairwise by the magnetic angle on top of each other, you get also interesting correlated physics, okay. And the system is very nicely tunable by a transverse electric field. If you apply a electric field, so we have a bottom gate electrode and a top gate electrode, so that we can apply opposite voltages to this electrode and apply a perpendicular electric field, an electric field perpendicular to the bilayer planes, okay? Then, you know, at charge neutrality, we can open gaps in the bilayer structure. You also have gaps at four electrons and four holes per mole unit cell. But now here, at two electrons per mole unit cell, at zero displacement field, the bands are not flat enough to have a correlated insulated behavior. But as you increase the displacement field, okay, you flatten the bands and you separate them from the remote bands and you have correlated insulated states appearing, okay? So this is a even more tunable system than magic angle thing. This magic angle twisted by layer by layer graphene, and it's a system that a lot of groups are investigating. So, now another thing which is very interesting is that many local probe studies have appeared, okay? So for example, in, you know, last, last uh, February or March, you know, three papers appeared in Nature and one in Nature Physics. Let me just rotate it to give proper credit. You know, the groups of Akai Pasupati, Ivan Dre, Ali Jizdani, and Stefan Perch, they all published the first local microscopic studies of, you know, using the scanning time microscopy of magic angle graphene. They found very interesting things. They found that indeed these remote bands are, you know, highly dispersive and then you have these flat bands, you know, and these flat bands have, for example, one of the interesting things that they found out is that the bandwidth of these flat bands increases when you put your Fermi energy in the flat band, okay? This means that the actual bandwidth is dependent on the filling, okay? And the bandwidth is, you know, the, the, is set pretty much by interaction effects in the system, okay? Bringing the system naturally into a 
u of a w of order one type of system, okay? Um, there was also evidence for nematicity in the system in a normal state. I will show you tomorrow a bit more about all of this. This bandwidth in, uh, increase with respect to single particle calculations was also reported, you know, earlier by our own group studies with my collaborator, Raya Shuri at MIT, by measuring electronic compressibility of magic angle graphene devices, okay? Now, the next, you know, investigation of um, scanning probe study was done uh, with our collaborator, Ellie Seldon, was published recently in Nature, okay? Ellie has this fantastic technique, you know, squid on a tip. He can place a superconducting quantum interference device on the tip, you know, of a, you know, on the apex of a tip, okay? And with that, you can very sensitively measure, you know, magnetic fields, okay, magnetic fluxes. That allowed him, you know, to, on devices where we could perform transport, okay? So this is transport for a given device, you know, uh, resistivity as a function of electron density, uh, you know, or, you know, filling factor, meaning, uh, number of electrons per more unit sound, you see here one, two, three, four, one hole, two holes, three holes, four holes per more unit cell. And this is also as a function of perpendicular magnetic field, you can see the Shunikov that has oscillations and you can see, you know, this, this band diagrams, you know, there's lambda funds that I should mention earlier, the correlated insulated states, you can see the superconductivity here. This is a very high quality device by, you know, global transport standards. And then with the scanning nanosquid, you can actually measure the Landau levels with extreme sensitivity at just one magnet, you know, one Tesla magnetic field. When you have much, much weaker signal in transport, you can measure these sharp, you know, Landau levels. And they nicely give you this four-fold degeneracy here, two-fold degeneracy here, one-fold degeneracy actually in no equals three, you know, four-fold for the remote bands. Not only, you know, this allowed us to do very fine spectroscopy of the Landau levels, but moreover, we could do this locally scanning in different areas of your device so that you could see that the twist angle, you can map the twist angle locally and see that there is actually twist angle variations across the device, okay? Now, for this particular device that is a high quality one, we can measure in, in, in this region, and this is the map of the twist angle, the gradient of twist angle. We can also measure the incommodogeneities in chemical potential. You can see that the twist angle in between the probes here, you know, this is for device V, this is for this region. It has this sort of two bumps. This bump here is due to this outer region, but in between this region, there is a full width at half maximum of this peak of about 0 0.01, 0 0.02 degrees, okay? So there is some variation in twist angle in these devices, and it leads to actually interesting quantum hole physics. I invite you to read more about uh, this in our paper. And this twist angle disorder is a new, type of disorder that wasn't present in, in other type of you know, bulk systems or studies, okay? This twist angle automatically means that you must have some strain. It automatically means that your bandwidths are locally changing, okay? Your, your band structure is locally changing in space. So there are many things associated with this twist angle disorder, which has, you know, very interesting physics associated with it. And, you know, it's, an, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's something that we can even try to use to our advantage to realize certain type of physics. So just to conclude, you know, this, I hope that I have convinced you that these correlated more structures constitute a new platform to, you know, study strongly correlated and topological physics. You can do this not only with graphene, but with any 2D material that you want. And we have 2D materials that exhibit by themselves all of the condensed matter behaviors that you can imagine, right? In, including quantum spin liquid superconductors, which are 2D materials themselves. Now you can twist them all and realize more super lattices, you know, and try to see, you know, bring correlations if they weren't there or modify the correlations if they were existing. So with this and this, you know, merging of the small communities, I just want to go to the last slide. You know, so uh, the experiments that I presented today were mostly done by my grad student, Yon Sal, also with Vala Fatimi, just some of the outlook is by Danielle and Jane. I mentioned some studies with Ellie Seldov, and then I'll show you tomorrow extra studies with Shahali Lani, and here's our collaborators, the MIT theory, and also theory collaborators. I'll mention more about this in tomorrow's lecture, and I want to thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Pablo. I give you some applause <laughs> in place of all the other participants. So if Thank there you. are any questions, you can place them now in, in the chat. And just open this, Let's see what we get. Maybe in the meantime, I can pose a question myself. Uh, if I understood you correctly, you mostly showed the uh, um, uh, the insulating phase that you that is is left on the whole doped side of the charge neutrality point, right? Yes. On the electron doped uh, 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 mod state, you don't have superconductivity in the vicinity. Is that is that correct? And and if so, yeah. why why not? Um, no, actually, there is superconductivity. In our original paper, we didn't see it in those devices that in those two devices that we measured that we reported, we didn't see it. But later on. In a study by Corey Dean and Andrea Young that they reproduced our results, they saw them, they saw it. By the time they saw it, we had made also additional devices ourselves and we also saw them. And by now, we see it very regularly. Yeah. Uh, the strongest superconductivity happens around two holes per mole unit cell, but there is also superconducting dome around two electrons per mole unit cell. And in fact, by now, people have seen even multiple domes for some devices. You have you know, many, many domes. So, it is, it is so it's it's, not clear what exactly it depends on, you know, uh, it, yeah. there's no sensitivity to, to sangle, there's sensitivity to disorder and, and et cetera, and it's still being investigated. But by now we pretty much in almost all of our devices, we see at least the superconductivity for two holes and for two electrons and often others. Yeah. Okay, okay. So that happened to be the first question here posed by Ingrid. Uh, so I guess this is answered by now. There's a second question by Jorik. Um, do you want to open your mic and ask the question yourself? I don't know if you can. Jorik? You uh, have to allow, allow him to speak. I don't know. Yeah, but I, I thought they are open. Uh, let's see. Oh, he's muted. So Jorik, do you wanna? So you should be able to open your mic. Um, I can mute them, but I cannot un unmute no, them. No, he doesn't have a mic, so you can ah, mute okay. Ah, okay. So the question is, uh, are these bilayer graphene devices stable in air, or do you have to keep them in controlled environment at all times? They are stable in air, okay? So in fact, we have we fabricate them in under atmospheric conditions, and the fact that they're encapsulating the hexane over night, it makes them further stable in air. So yeah, no, very mm -hmm. much stable in air. Mm -hmm. Okay, question by uh, Si Shao. Do you have a mic? Hello? Yes. Yep. Hi, uh, thank you for the uh, very nice presentation. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, so uh, many people also work on the Magirona particles. I'm wondering if uh, any people also looking for the Magirona in this uh, graphene uh, system, this uh, mm -hmm. barrier uh, graphene system. Mm -hmm. So a number of the order parameters that have been proposed by theorists, uh, including the first one by saint Kishu in the Valence paper, are uh, good lead to topological superconductivity. Okay, so for example, this D plus ID is a chiral topological you know, superconductivity. Um, however, there are different types of topological superconductivity and not all of them have necessarily, you know, uh, all the ingredients that you would wanna have for you know, the type of major physics that is being investigated in semiconductor or nanowires coupled to superconductors, for example. So right now, no one has been able yet to determine the symmetry of the other parameters. So we don't know if the system you know, it would be amenable to Majorana physics, but, you know, even if the superconductivity itself is not topological in the system, you can engineer the system because it's a superconductor on top of various substrates you know, and include ferromagnetism, include, you know, other things, you know, that would allow you in principle to realize you know, topological superconductivity and general physics. But I think we are, for, for the moment, the community is mostly busy with the system itself before they try to engineer even, you know, more advanced things such as major physics in the system. Mm -hmm. Ying Zheng, do you want to ask a question? I don't hear him. 
Hello, can you hear yes. me? Yes, yes, we hear you. Okay. Yes, I'm wondering if you have a spatial probe of superconducting order parameter, the system you showed us. Mm -hmm. Very good question. So, in principle, there are some probes of superconducting order. You know, the, the way you probe, you know, let, 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 for example, let's think about how did people get the, you know, the cuprates were D weight, okay? So, uh, the original experiments were done by Delph and Harlingen, you know, where they made, you know, these corner junctions, you know, squids, you know, where they could put an S-wave superconductor in contact with the cuprates from a squid and they could see that, you know, because these uh, cuprate superconductors have a D-wave order parameter, you know, they would see a phase shift in the face of the squid, you know. Now, these th those types of experiments are hard but not impossible to do with magic and graphene because the equivalent of this corner of this crystal facet for the cuprate is now a line edge at the side of the magic and graphene, okay? So, you know, some groups, including ourselves, are trying to investigate this, this, this. Now, in terms of spatial probe, you know, one thing that you could have, for example, you know, perhaps is to have a Josephson Junction STM, you know, this type of uh, STMs with the superconducting tip where you are able to pick up something, you know, regarding superconductivity locally. Those have been done again recently in cuprates by a number of groups and in other superconducting materials, but those are extremely challenging and people, the STM groups that can do that have not done, applied those techniques yet to magic angle graphene. Okay, so I am not sure about other, you know, ways of checking locally the order parameter. But for now, we would just want to check it globally and then maybe uh, you know, locally, but uh, even globally, it's not, you know, it's, it's turning out to be a difficult problem to check. But as more and more groups start working on this, I think that eventually we will be able to design a proper experiment to do this. Thank you very much. Uh, any more questions? Actually, I will ask one myself. Um, the parallelity of of, uh, of these uh, uh, twisted uh, graphene layers uh, to to the high TC uh, cuprates, to the high TC superconductors, is very is very fascinating. But how about uh, the insulating phase itself? You've been concentrating on the metallic or or superconducting part of the phase diagram, but in the insulating regime, do you see any any local moment physics, uh, magnetic ordering, or anything of that kind? So yes, there is actually uh, interesting studies, you know, some of them we've done ourselves and other, uh, also others. So this magnetism that I mentioned earlier, okay, so a different number of electrons per more unit cell, integers, okay, at one, two, and three, you can realize magnetism of different kinds when your graphene is aligned to the HBN. But actually, even when the graphene is not aligned to the HBN, people have seen that by now that there is a, a finite magnetic moment, for example, at one electron per more unit cell. That was already, mm -hmm. you know, I will mention this tomorrow. This was reported in our collaboration with Shahali Lani uh, in a Nature paper recently. And I will mention a bit more about that uh, tomorrow. So the system, uh, spontaneously, you know, breaks the flavor symmetry and decides to go towards a spin polarized state, you know, at nu equals one, okay? okay. At one electron per more unit cell. Um, the one, the correlated insulated state, which is closest to superconductivity in most devices is the one at two electrons or two holes per more unit cell. Right. And there, it is less clear exactly what happens, if there is any magnetism or not, and of what type. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's not a simple, you know, spin polarized insulating state, uh, as, at least as measured in transport. You know, in fact, when you apply a magnetic field, as I mentioned today, you, you kill the insulated state, okay? So it's more complex, you know. In our initial transport studies, we reported that the, the, the decrease in the gap with the finite magnetic field, and it happens both for perpendicular and parallel magnetic field, means that the system is spin unpolarized, okay? Mm -hmm. So now, whether there is antiferromagnetism or spin and polarized or something else, 
Um, it's now, as we get more and more data, it's turning into an interesting question because of this, you know, because the system has these extra degrees of freedom, valleys. So you can have valley magnetism uh, in addition or instead of spin magnetism. So there are many things that one can can do and, and, and have and, you know, people are probing and, and I think more interesting results are going to be coming out very soon about this. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, answer. Um, I don't see any further questions for the time being. So I think you just made a good advertisement for tomorrow's lecture. Uh, thank you very much for today. Thank you. And everybody. I'll see you and all the other ones uh, tomorrow. Okay. okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye.